So it's been four years. It's been four years since microservices architecture first captured our attention. It was promised as an architectural style that let us compose small, unique services around business domain problems to build complex and wonderful solutions. A network of interconnected services choreographed beautifully to give our users an uninterrupted experience. This was a grassroots movement, and our developer community felt quite passionate about it. Passionate about building autonomous teams that can own the destiny of each service that they build from ideation to release to user. Obviously, we embraced its complexity, and we built a healthy ecosystem of tools and techniques to let us automate um, you know, delivery pipelines in a federated manner to allow us to release code you know, um, from commit to production for the first time in a truly independent way. This is the first architecture that truly allows us to release um, capabilities independently of each other. It does sound like a utopian destination, doesn't it? So for the last few years, um, my coworkers and myself at ThoughtWorks have been building microservices architecture. And today I'm going to share some of those real-world challenges that you will face, especially in large organizations. And hopefully for those, I will give you a few tactics to maneuver these obstacles. The first one is an organizational problem. It's how the teams are formed, how the budgeting is allocated, how the money flows in large corporates. The second one is the you know, battle of monoliths, battling legacy systems and build migrating into a small service-oriented architecture. Once you've gone through these two obstacles, now you have to curb the enthusiasm of your new starters getting excited about modeling services. Modeling services is hard especially moving too fast towards too fine-grained services without the operational readiness. OK, if you think that building microservices architecture, um, the main challenge you have for that is a technical problem, is you know, coding, design, and DevOps practices, think again. It's an organizational problem. So this is a recurring theme at many of our clients. It starts roughly around this time of year. Different parts of organization gets together to fight for a budget for the list of projects they have for the year. It's called the portfolio planning, the annual portfolio planning. Once they get budget for their projects, they start forming ephemeral teams for, for each team to go off and implement a single project. When the project's delivered, the team dissipates, and they move on to the next project. And the cycle continues. So what is wrong with this picture? Well, if you want to re-architect your system towards microservices, and you have to go through an annual budgeting, it's very difficult to build a business case to let you migrate architecture. It's almost impossible without showing that you can deliver business value without demonstrating you can value, deliver value with that re-architecture to your consumers. And once you got that business case in place and convinced and got money for re-architecture, the second problem you have is that you don't have long-standing teams to own the services in an autonomous way. So how are we going to go around this? Right. So we first start with creating a business incentive you have to convince the product people and business people that this re-architecture would, you know, would give you the objective that the business wants. So what could it be? In many organizations, it's a scale of operation. Like Netflix, going from you know, renting videos to streaming um, movies online to millions of people. In some organizations, it's the speed of delivery. You want twice the speed of delivery that you have today. Maybe you want to expand your business into new domains and be able to compose solutions to, you know, to pivot your, your business. So whatever it is, be very clear about it and bring really your product and business people along this journey and articulate and align your business initiatives with your architectural style. 
you need to start plant seeding, uh, sorry, seed the plant of platform thinking, building solutions on a platform of services. If you are able to do that, you're halfway there. You can either get money for your re-architecture as a tax for those business initiatives, because now it's aligned, or you have won the hearts and minds of business as why re-architecture matters, so you can allocate budget to it. But you have to demonstrate it. So start with a hypothesis. Start with a small hypothesis as how this architecture is going to get you go faster, and start building a proof of concept for that. Once you can successfully demonstrate it, then you build a cross-skilled, start building you know, cross-skilled teams that own building a service or multiple services um, to production. And while you're doing that, you build the foundation for automation and you know, seamless release of code to production. From there, you go through expansion. You expand that model to other projects and other teams and start continuously evolving from you know, a project-based mindset to a product and service-based mindset, from short-term ephemeral teams to long-standing teams. And the cycle continues. It's an evolutionary, iterative way to wear out the grooves that old organizational thinking and old structures have, has put in place. Once you go through your organizational problem, the next one up, one of the hardest is how are we going to deconstruct the old legacy systems? And it's really not the question of how I'm going to decompose this system, but it's the question of how I'm going to decompose a system that is continuously under change, it's being used by you know, many users, and how I'm going to do this in a financial viable way? So to give you an example, my current client tried to pull out a very simple CRUD-based service out of a 2.5 million lines of code of legacy system that was built over 10 years, the last 10 years, and guess how much it costed? The same amount of dollars as the number of lines of code in that legacy system. That's not financially viable. Can we even do it in a health lifespan of a healthy you know, developer? So, it is costly, so it becomes this, you know, the, the migration becomes a continuous trade-off between shall I extract code and reuse, or shall I retire code and rewrite a new one? And you have to do this continuous cost and benefit analysis as you go through experimentation of either models. So I give you a few heuristics uh, to, go, to go about this deconstruction. The first one is, Find the seams around your business capabilities in your existing system. They might exist. So the picture you see above, it was an analysis I did on a um, .NET code base, a package dependency between them, to, sh to see whether I can find these you know, seams and boundaries of business capabilities to pull them out. Uh, unfortunately, in this one, I really couldn't see any clear boundaries. Use the structure analysis tools or runtime um, analysis tools to find, find the seams. As I said before, we have to continuously evaluate um, whether it's worth taking a code out or not. So don't forget the toxicity and liveliness of your code. What this diagram shows, what we were trying to find out is what are the toxic part of the code or healthy part of the code that are alive and being used. The black circles are toxic code underuse. What this picture reminded me of was flying over Australia and seeing rings of bushfire going through the land. And we know that fire is a necessary element for renewal, and that's exactly what I wanted to do to that system, use fire to, um, to renew it. So we talked about finding seams around bounded context, use the theory of constraints. You want to go fast, you want to scale parallel development, what is it in your system right now that is the most limiting factor? Find those hot spots and remove them. To give you an example, I'm deconstructing a big monolith right now. It's a web-based you know, commerce system, and one point of contention is uh, the, the, the session management. You know, logging users, identifying users, and associating attributes with a user, and that's Co coupling all the other user-centric services to this monolith. So we try to pull that out first. 
apply a strangler pattern. There is a healthy dose of documentation around this, but the idea is that you start building new capabilities or replicating the capabilities by writing new code around your services. Put an Nginx in front of it and reroute your direction to, the, to new capabilities versus the old one unless the old, until the old one can be retired. This is another technique that I've started um, experimenting with. I call it monolith in a box. I could call it monolith in a coffin. Um, the idea is that sometimes we don't need to change the monolith, but we need to run it and execute it and test the systems that we've built around it with it. And with these kind of old systems, testing and execution and deployment is really difficult. You know, you have configurations scattered all over your infrastructure, business logic into, in your F5 load balancers. So what we're trying to do is um, really wrap the monolith and all the um, configuration and its system dependencies into um, containers so the developers can just spawn a container, never worry about building it and configuring it, and just talk to it. And lastly, Refactor what matters. If you have gone through the experience of aligning your architectural needs with your business objectives, you should have a good idea as where the change is going to happen, where the need for invention, innovation, and experimentation is. So start pulling out those ports of codes or re-implementing those. So hopefully, this gives you some ideas as how to deconstruct the monolith, but I feel like this Deconstruction and refactoring a monolith worth a two-hour talk in itself in another time. Right. So you can only imagine how excited we are right now, right? We've gone through battling the organization structure, getting money for our re-architecture, um, found ways of working around this monolith, and now we get to do the fun part, modeling our shiny new services. But a pattern that we see over and over again is we go too fine-grained too early. Modeling services is really hard. So what things we have to kind of consider when we get to this stage? The question that I often get asked is, so how big is this microservice? And I feel if we could go back in time and change something in the history of mankind, probably replacing micro with another attribute would have been one of them. My, the idea of a microservice is that it's an independently releasable service around your business domain concept. Some people think, oh, it has to be you know, um, in a size that a two-pizza team, the idea of Amazon two-pizza team, a team that can be fed with two pizzas, um, can maintain it and support it. Size portions are quite large in the in US, so that might be too large. Some people say, oh, six people, six services. That might be too small. Um, an analogy of fitting it in somebody's head, my coworker from ThoughtWorks, James Lewis's head has been mentioned. He's a smart man with a pretty large head, maybe too large. The one I like is that you can kind of replace it in two weeks, depending on your, I guess, programming language and infrastructure. But the point is, it has to be as small as you can handle it. What I mean by that if, is that if your uh, organizational maturity in terms of automation and streamlining development process is not just there yet to handle more than two services, two services probably you know, too large. So make sure that you encapsulate business logic in the service and you don't leak that to your, um, kind of to your consumers. And build the automation and the handling distributed systems in a way that you can, you, know, um, you can have a healthy size. And the size can change over time. This one, no utility services, please. So um, I have this drawer in my kitchen where all these utensils that don't fit in any of the other nicely organized drawers end up in there. And I usually try to pull it out, and it gets stuck, and it's really hard. I see these services that are reminding me of my, uh, of my messy kitchen drawer, where things, concepts that quite fit in other domains, they get pushed into it. You know, a config service, and these are usually shared services. Config service, utility service, reference data. If you find yourself building one of those, stop. Think again. 
because it becomes one of those bottlenecks very soon as a shared service. So I've seen people putting country codes um, in a service as a reference data. How often do we build or create new countries? Not that often. So maybe duplicating that information across services is perfectly fine. Um, or if you have any other you know, capabilities that you want to put that service, think about the domain context that it belongs more closely. And with the best of our intention, it might happen that we choose the wrong boundary for our services. Um, have you seen those stressed parents on a flight where, for some reason, the two toddlers are sitting in the front of the plane and the um, parents are sitting at the back of the plane? It happens, right? So how do we find these right boundaries? If you sit around the table and think academically, what are these beautiful domain concepts, we probably don't end up with the right boundary. So my suggestion is use your user experience and user journeys. What are the real use cases of your system? Walk through them and then build domain services that support those. And test the boundaries by saying, OK, if I'm building these kind of related features for my end user, how many services do I need to touch? For instance, if I'm a mobile provider and I want to support international roaming, there are a whole bunch of capabilities around that. How many services do I need to change? If you're changing more than three services, you probably got the boundaries wrong. And you can't really realize the um, the idea of the, um, independence. And even if you got the boundaries wrong, that's fine, because REST level three maturity model will come to save us. If we use hyperlinks between the aggregate routes and their sub nodes, we can move that around. We have more flexibility in decoupling the services or joining them and not impacting our consumers, because our consumers are just following the hyperlinks. And it's, I can't emphasize this really um, enough to say that we should not build any services without having an automated path to release. We started building microservices for an, a pizza enterprise company in Australia a couple of years back, and we were so excited. You know, we went from no services to 60 services in three months. We had all these independent built pipelines. Uh, we had some principles locked down early on, which was really good, some practices. We said no single line of code, a service code, without a contract test. So the first thing that we built, if we thought of a new service, was how the consumer is going to reuse it and write a contract test for it. Then we would write a mock or a prototype to show how the request responses would flow through the service. And then we would write the service code. And as we do that, we build the delivery pipeline and automation for it. We made a few mistakes, if I could go back. One of them was we compromised on a few things. We compromise on debuggability, you know, using correlation IDs so we can debug our services live. I probably built that early on. We did have, you know, good monitoring and health, um, health check, uh, but we didn't have good debugging built in place. We invested early on in scaffolding. Some people call it chassis or service templates. Basically, all the boilerplate um, code that you need to build to, um, that, to to put your service logic in the, in the shell. So monitoring, health, exposing health metrics, the structured logging, authentication, security, all those sort of stuff. Right. So we've talked about the values, different values of microservices, but we need to acknowledge the complexities that come with it. We love the idea of autonomous teams, but teams are made of people. And people form groups. And you know, silos happen. So there is a communication overhead that comes with that autonomy. We love microservices because it lets us go fast. We can build a single small, small service you know, to production very quickly. But to be able to do that, there is an execution overhead and complexity. All the automation that we have to build in place to be able to deliver it to, you know, seamlessly. 
We like microservices because it gives us scale. Now you can break down the domain problem into small subdomains, allocate teams to each subdomain, and give them you know, autonomy. Building distributed systems is hard. Building resilience, consistency, and all of those things bring some complexity to your infrastructure. We expose wonderful you know, fine-grained APIs that let our consumers to compose different solutions. The composability gives us um, you know, new ways of building systems. But now we have to maintain a range of APIs and backward compatibility, and that maintenance has its own overhead. We can use different technology stacks for every service, as long as it you know, talks and walks like a service from outside, I can use whatever tech stack I want for the service. But now our operation team or, you know, generally the organization needs to deal with a proliferation of um, technology stacks. So what I would suggest is get one of these giant granularity sliders and really find the spot in the number of services and granularity of the services for your organization to get a net positive value. So if you're going to micro, you need to bring the automation and the infrastructure um, to support that. So find that right spot for where you are, where your organization is. And lastly, I would leave you with this. We have talked about um, you know, the softer side of architecture, the complexity of communication between people, people who build the services and people who consume the services. And that communication overhead causes friction between the teams. So I argue that for us to be able to successfully deliver microservices architecture, we need a leap in our empathetic evolution. We need to adopt empathetic development practices that really let us understand the needs of the consumer. So there are a whole bunch of techniques that are already out there. Build APIs that your consumers actually need. Get the consumers to give you contract tests to validate your assumptions about how they are using your service. As service providers, provide mocks to the consumers so that they can run their applications independent of you know, really difficult integration, um, integration tests. And if you are an empathetic technologist and like to solve complex problems in these big, hairy organizations, um, come and talk to me. Maybe we have a home for you at ThoughtWorks. Thank you.